Hello, and welcome to International Dark Sky Week 2020. My name is John Barentine, and I am the Director of Public Policy at the International Dark Sky Association. In a previous life, I was an academic astronomer and involved in astronomy research for many years. One of my ongoing research interests is the history of astronomy, which is what brought me to a subject that I will be talking to you about over the next several days. I've published two books on the history of the constellations, and in particular, a subset of the constellations that no longer appears on star charts. These lost constellations tell us much about how our modern night sky came to be, and their gradual disappearance through history relates in a particular way to dark skies. Yet they can still be seen if you know just where to look. We'll start today with an overview of the lost constellations, and on the days that follow, we'll look at seven examples. In each case, I will show you a finder chart so that you can try to locate these oddities of astronomical history for yourself. Any map of the night sky will show 88 constellations whose names, figures, and boundaries have been constant for nearly a century. But this was not always the case. The quantity of constellations, their names and demarcations, were once the prerogative of the people who drew star charts, causing confusion among astronomers in specifying which stars belonged to which figures. In the aftermath of the First World War, European as astronomers assembled to form the International Astronomical Union, or IAU, which took up as one of its first tasks to settle the issue once and for all. Completing its work in 1930, the charts IAU published that year show a canon of official constellations now recognized by astronomers everywhere. Each star in the night sky is now clearly associated with one and only one constellation. But first, let's take a step back. What is a constellation in the first place? Merriam-Webster defines the word as, quote, any of 88 arbitrary configurations of stars or an area of the celestial sphere covering one of those configurations, close quote. That definition considers both the ancient idea of constellations as well as a modern way of thinking about them. Constellations are fundamentally human inventions. The stars aren't arranged in any way that forms deliberate patterns so we can pick them out of our night sky. It's something of an accident of where our solar system is in our galaxy and which bright stars happen to be near us at any given period of time. The arrangements of stars we see in tonight's sky are different from those that would have been seen a million years ago or that will be seen a million years in the future. The constellations are also an illusion. We see the stars as though they were all equally far away, projected onto the so-called plane of the night sky but there are vast differences between Earth and the stars and large distances between them. And their apparent brightnesses depend not only on that distance, but also on the intrinsic brightnesses of the stars themselves. Just because a star appears bright in our night sky doesn't mean that it is either nearby or especially luminous. In this example, the stars comprising the Big Dipper group of stars in the night sky, also known as the plow, are shown according to their distances from Earth. Five are physically associated with one another in space, but two are considerably more distant. In projection on the sky, we see them as though they were seven bright stars that naturally go together. And yet these seven stars a constellation do not make. They are part of a constellation recognized in the Western tradition as Ursa Major, the Great Bear. The Big Dipper, or Plow, is an example of an asterism, a grouping of stars that doesn't quite reach constellation status. Unlike constellations, Asterisms have no official status among astronomers at all. Anyone can identify them and name them at any time. Historically, constellations were simply groups of bright stars representing figures of mythology, nature, or history, each with their own associated folklore. But they're also arbitrary. World cultures have seen many different figures in the same groups of stars. In modern astronomy, we would simply say that a constellation is one of the officially recognized divisions of the night sky given its own name and boundaries in order to distinguish its area from all of the other divisions, each with a name and boundaries. Therefore, while constellations were once firmly tied to human cultural traditions, they're now simply conveniences for astronomers to keep track of what belongs where. A map of the night sky is not unlike a map of the Earth, just as every bit of land on our planet is claimed by a country and within its boundaries, so too does every bit of the night sky belong to one and only one officially recognized constellation. For nearly a hundred years, by consensus among professional astronomers, they have existed unchanged. But before about the year 1900, 
there was simply no such consensus. While certain constellations were recognized in the Western tradition since ancient times, parts of the night sky consisting of fainter stars didn't seem to belong to any constellation and were thought of as unformed. For hundreds of years, enterprising astronomers and map makers appropriated sea stars to create new constellations in hopes of achieving some lasting fame and maybe some fortune. Best-selling charts had the greatest influence and the invented constellations of their map makers stood the greatest chance of being adopted. And some were copied by others. The latest to be introduced that remain in the modern canon date to the end of the 17th century. Others fell out of favor and they gradually disappeared from star charts completely. Toward the end of the 19th century, depending on whose star chart one consulted, one found anywhere from 60 to 120 constellations. Although no new constellations were then being proposed, there also seemed little hope for reaching agreement on which figures counted properly and which did not. Quote, not only are the figures uncouth and the origin often frivolous, wrote the textbook author Joel Dorman Steele in 1884, but the boundaries are not distinct. Though the constellations are rude and imperfect, there seems little hope of any change. Age gives them a dignity that ensures their perpetuation, unquote. But a practical problem in astronomy forced to that change and resulted in the partitioning of the night sky that lasts even today. Even before the invention of the telescope, astronomers knew that some stars didn't shine steadily over time. Rather, their light output changed in some way. These so-called variable stars were traditionally identified according to the name of the constellation in which they appeared. The need for clear identifications was crucial in order to ensure that information about variable stars was properly communicated from one astronomer to another. The problem becomes obvious if we can't all agree on where one constellation ends and the next one begins. Variable star studies were very fashionable in the 19th century but researchers were frustrated by the inability to adhere to the traditional naming rules. This was important in order to reconcile historical observations with new ones. When the world's professional astronomers met together for the first time in 1922, they agreed that there was a sufficiently important problem to decide the boundaries of the constellations once and for all. The list of constellations then in circulation was pared down to 88, and these were deemed official. With clear boundaries between constellations, disputes over the identities of certain variable stars were effectively settled. Since the number of official constellations today exceeds the number that was in circulation before the First World War, it means that some inevitably were thrown out and became lost. Which constellations were kept and which were discarded in the 20th century sorting process was somewhat dependent on the victors of the war in writing the subsequent history. For example, all new constellations introduced after antiquity by German astronomers were discarded, but contributions by Dutch, French, and Polish map makers were retained. The lost constellations are important today because they teach us of how humans try to impose a sense of order and structure on the night sky. They may also have something to tell us about the night sky of the future. As the sun in our solar system orbits the Milky Way, making one complete circuit every 250 million years, we move with respect to the stars around us, those that are bright enough and near enough to be seen by the unaided eye in the night sky. Tonight's patterns of bright stars are not those of many thousands or millions of years from now. In the distant future, the night sky will not resemble ours at all, and future generations of humans will be confronted with choices about what to call the groups of stars they see in their night sky. The lost constellations run the gamut from fantastic beasts to the apparatus of the arts and sciences, but they share one thing in common, a lack of bright stars to make their figures memorable. Yet despite disappearing from official star charts, these figures remain in the night sky and can still be easily found if one knows where to look. This week, we'll explore some of the lost constellations that you can locate in your own night sky, explain where they came from and what they mean, and how they disappeared from star charts over the centuries. <laughs>